I'll admit, I'm not a very good investor <laughs> in the markets. That's I, not what you told have, me a few <laughs> weeks ago. You said you had some winners in, in mind and you were going to ride mean, those hard. I, I've, I've rode some winners, but I've also had some big losers too. So, Welcome everybody to the Mind the Grow podcast. I am Chris Kinghorn. And I'm Eric Hoffman. And so Eric, this is our uh, first weekly release, huh? First one. I'm excited. Welcome to the world, Mind the Growth. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you think? We uh, we should probably give a quick ex- explanation of what, what uh, Mind the Growth is all about. Um, yeah. You know, in this podcast, um, thanks for everybody for tuning in. Uh, but what we want to do and what we're looking to accomplish is uh, really share our interests, some of our insights and our network with you. And, you know, we hope you guys enjoy the ride. Make sure to subscribe and like on your way in. Yeah. Give us a review as well if you're on a platform that offers reviews. I'm sure that's probably helpful. We're new to this, so who the hell knows? Feedback but, would be uh, great. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know if you want to give a shout out, but this podcast could be sponsored by your friends at The Good Life. Still wearing the shirts, <laughs> yeah. still not still sponsored. <laughs> you, you know, always remember the most comfortable fitting shirt a man can wear. Do yourself a favor and slip into the good life. Good life. I Sponsor love that. us, please. <laughs> I love that. I mean, you're a natural. F- free plug. <laughs> free plug. Um, all right, let's kick it off. So uh, maybe let's explain a little about who we are, what we do, and maybe why we're doing this. Sure, sure. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm Eric Hoffman. I have been working with a family company for the past 11 years, my family in particular. Uh, we run a medical malpractice insurance company. And right now we've we've grown quite a bit since I've come on board. And uh, we do a, about mid nine figures in revenue for each year. And so it, it's something that we are proud of and we still want to grow further and continue along that path. And at the same time, I have lots of other interests and other passions that I'm getting into and wanting to pursue. This happens to be one of them. And Chris, you approached me uh, in terms of starting this up. And Chris, as some of you may know, is uh, a friend of my younger brothers and a former roommate of my younger brothers. And he's been doing a lot of cool stuff lately as well. So tell us what you're up to, Chris. So I decided it was a great idea to get into the technology field with um, minimal to no technology experience. So uh, over the last five years, I have built a construction technology startup, um, really started from the experience that I had learned from growing up in the construction industry. And uh, we now have a uh, platform for subcontractors. Uh, we also work with general contractors um, and we've managed to you know grow to a, a comfortable size and um, it's been rewarding. It's been full of lots of learning experiences, but um, I've enjoyed it. So it's it's exposed me to the engineering side, the sales side of things, venture capital, a little bit of investment banking side as well too. Um, and part of my goal for this was to you know share some of my network and my experiences with uh, fellow startup founders and really anybody else that is interested in you know any sort of entrepreneurial um, endeavor. And I think what we share is some passions in the the fun and finer things in life. For instance, I think what we're going to get into quite a bit on this podcast is business as a whole, the you know equity markets, the crypto markets, wine, watches, cars, all those sorts of things. So that's what we're going to be focused on amongst whatever else comes up that fascinates us. So should we start I, with the risk check? Is the, is it too premature for that? <laughs> Uh, my wrist is bare today, but I like that. next okay. week I, uh, I'll, I'll have a winner for you. What do you got on tonight? No, oh, wrong one, wrong one. I have, I've got uh, the sub on, I've got the go. old trusty sub, so it's not going to fluctuate too much. Unfortunately for me, maybe, uh, <laughs> my well, goal is to have the collection <laughs> going more like yours, Mr. Hoffman. Yeah, we'll see uh, if, if all goes well and you guys keep supporting us, then we'll have plenty more to show you. So. Oh yeah, and this podcast can also be sponsored by Rolex, Protect the Leap, <laughs> AP. You know, any of you guys who want to throw some watches our way, we'll be happy 
to talk about you all day long. Yeah, so I have to stop by mind. stop by Coffin and Trout over in Channel or say hey to Leo. <laughs> yeah, Leo, I need to be on the list too. So <laughs> keep me on the, the list. list. Perfect. So uh, I think I want to touch on what the podcast means uh, for me, um, just to, to mm-hmm. put that out there for the listeners. Um, I, I kind of mentioned a little bit, you know, I've been able to build my network with, with kind of my niche. And um, I think it's exposed me to a lot of people that other people wouldn't necessarily be able to get access to, um, whether through it's real, wh- whether through real estate, kind of the technology side, the VC side. Um, and every one of these individuals, I think, is is uh, holds knowledge that not only I can learn from, um, but others can as well, too. And I think uh, I've been able to surround myself with some great people. And um, coming soon is going to be some interviews. And we're going to share some of our networks with the list, uh, with the viewers and really just wanted to kind of, you know, give people um, an in-depth look at, at what that might look like. Yeah. And just to get into the name a little bit, it was both random and very specific. <laughs> what I mean by that is mind the growth is kind of a play play on words from the phrase in London. If you've been to the UK, there's uh, a subway system called the tube and they say mind the gap whenever you're getting onto one of the subway trains. So I don't know why that stuck with me for all these years, but uh, mind the growth felt like a nice little play on that. And in real terms, why it's specific is I think Chris and I, and I'll speak for you in this and you can add on, I think we share a desire to have a continual growth in our lives, both personally and professionally. And we want to continue to learn. We want to continue to share what we learn and really talk to people that are really fascinating or doing really cool things in the world, both locally. uh, That's definitely where we're going to start in our local network. And hopefully we can expand from there to talk to a lot more people uh, beyond our, you know, small borders here in Phoenix. So that to me is really the goal of this show and this podcast. And um, yeah, anything you want to add to that, Chris? Yeah, because when I, when I think of the word growth, uh, there's so many different definitions that come to mind. But ultimately, you can grow financially, you can grow emotionally, you can grow physically. So our goal is to not only understand how to do that in a variety of different ways, but talk to people who you know might have more growth on one side than we do. So really just continuing the learning process and really soaking up as much as you can from other people is, is really the goal, um, at least on my end. Cool. So let's let's see what we can do to get that accomplished. Should we start so, in on the market and and yeah, <laughs> there's not a lot of growth let's going on there, that. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of decline. In fact, uh, so just to I guess start us off, I I've I'll I'll, I'll admit I'm not a very good investor <laughs> in the markets. <laughs> That's I, not what you told have, me a few weeks ago. You said you had some winners in, in mind and you were going to ride mean, those hard. I, I've, I've rode some winners, but I've also had some big losers too. So uh, in terms of a stock picker, I am not a great one. I, I have a few that have done very well. I mean, shout out to Apple and all you do because you've made me a lot of money. But uh, when I jumped on the Chamath SPAC train, I lost quite a bit <laughs> in jumping into that uh, shit show. So that that took a hit, but it's an education. And more recently, I've actually gotten out of 99% of my positions when the Fed originally announced that they were going to jump rates in this coming year. Mm-hmm. So I luckily have saved quite a bit in getting out while right. the market was tanking, but I'm slowly planning to inch back in. I just bought uh, some stocks in Amazon that I in I can't imagine doesn't make doesn't double or triple in the next five to six years. So I think that's always a safe play. Uh, I'll probably get back into Apple and maybe some of those other growth stocks. But really, what I should be doing and what I've sh- should have done from the get go is 
put my money into an ETF of sorts and just <laughs> let it sit there <laughs> and not fuck with it too much. But that's not how I roll. I like do you to, do you think that during COVID? I mean, uh, obviously, yeah. ecosystems changed. Was there more of a focus on short term investing for you? And have for you sure. just yeah. rebalanced to kind of a little bit more position more so long term? Yeah, yeah. I mean, with when COVID hit in March of 2020, and the market originally tanked, I, I, I don't know that anyone really expected it to rebound as quickly as it did, mm -hmm. but it did and it kept going. So I got on that train, I started buying uh, stocks, you know, pretty in pretty hefty amounts at maybe in, I would say, August, September of 2020, when it appeared they weren't going to re-crash <laughs> and right. so uh i i made a decent chunk right off the bat and i stuck with a few but then there was a few corrections along the way i got scared i got out of a few i i, I think the biggest dumb move that i did was in nvidia i bought that at like i can't remember it must have been like 110 dollars a share and it it jumps to probably 350 maybe 400 bucks at its peak okay and um i i i wrote it to like 180 and then it took a, a big dip back down and i'm like nope can't do this it's gonna crash <laughs> sold it all and uh never got back in so that's kind of been my my learning experiences over the last two years is figuring out how you you don't time the market you spend time in the market i forget right. who said that but that's a famous quote and it's just taken me some time to figure out that nothing lasts that long i think my my stock stories are a lot less exciting than yours i <laughs> i think my portfolio mo most of my portfolios in financial etfs you know some voo vti um that's a lot that's of what you got to do dividend <laughs> uh, not a handful of growth but i do have to say um i did try to i did try to do a little timing um i took i tried to do timing on three stocks i tried to do it on boeing which has not played out amazing um <laughs> it's I, i'm just hasn't been terrible for me um when did you get in first of all i got in i got in under 200 and then okay. i got in again in the low 200s and i i checked a few days ago and i think it was it was right it was hovering right around 200 so that one's kind of a that was kind of a you know break even and i've always been a, form, a firm believer on if i'm going to be rolling the dice i guess i love i love crypto so Crypto is my exactly rolling the dice, which, which we'll get into <laughs> exactly. Um, Ford, I did do well on Ford. Um, I think my yeah. basis was just under uh, just under ten bucks, and that one ran all the way up to twenty seven or so. I still hold it. They brought back the dividend, so I was excited about that. But it's kind of crashed down to about twenty bucks or so. And the yeah. uh, the one that I'm not proud of because I own crypto is I bought Coinbase. I bought it after the IPO after it went down a little bit. Woof. I just knew it was the bottom and it was not the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Those uh, never ending bottoms will really get you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that's one that you just hold on for forever. Yeah. And it essentially I mean, serves as a crypto ETF for the time being is was, that was my, for sure. my mindset. I mean, they're putting out incredible numbers in their quarterly reports. So regardless of the stock price, I think that, is definitely more of a long-term hold. So right. My think, my worry is though is, be a big winner. is is everyone kind of it seems as if the I mean you look at the Robin Hood theory or it, off offering at least you've got you know the ability to trade crypto for free. Obviously you don't own the coins until they release their wallet and who knows when exactly that that's going to be. I've heard it's mm -hmm. been hearing for a while that it's going to come out, but we'll see. Um, but uh, they just charge so much per transaction uh, compared to a lot of the other exchanges. So I yeah. feel like eventually they're going to have to bring that down. What's that going to do to revenue? Um, but I know they've got a lot of other partnerships and whatnot going on. So it'll be, I think they're, they're a big enough player in the game where they're going to be around for a while. And I think they're going to do some great things. Yeah, totally. I mean, with FTX and some of those other exchanges mm -hmm. that are having basically 0% fees in trading, 
it's going to have to come down. It's going to have to remain competitive. But I think you're right. Brian Armstrong's a strong CEO, mm. and I think they have the advantage of being a relative first mover in the market. So I don't see them going anywhere. I think it's going to be a handful of players for the long term that are going to win out. But we'll see. And hopefully your stock doesn't continue to tank. <laughs> we will We will find out. Um, yeah. So I want to see how well this ages because I want to look back on this question in a year from now and, and see how just really right on or how far off we were, you know, whatever that looks like, whatever that picture looks like. Um, but um, favorite stock at the moment or whatever, you, what, what do you see the most potential in? I mean, I mentioned before, I just bought Amazon. You can't say Amazon. <laughs> that's That's way too easy. <laughs> I well, if I'm betting, I'm gonna pick an easy one. Um, <laughs> I want something but, that's not gonna age well. <laughs> Jesus, what's well, not gonna age well? I mean, I'll throw it out there. Peloton, it is just doing well, so terrible right now. Can it go further see, down? Probably, but I don't think Apple's gonna buy them. I don't know if it makes the most sense. Is it a move that could make sense potentially? I think they'd have to kind of tear down the. The company and kind of steal some of their IP for parts and pieces, but I'm going to throw a Peloton out there. So not financial that's an advice. One. Not financial yeah. advice. <laughs> so I, I'll disclose that I own a Peloton treadmill and I I run on it most days. So I actually like the product. I think it's a great product, and um, they put out pretty good content with mm -hmm. their trainers and their app and everything. So I think it's great. Where I think they went wrong is when they IPO'd in their disclosures, they're talking about how uh, they're basically their market is anyone making roughly, f I think, 45 or 50 grand a year, which nobody making 45 or 55 grand a year is going to look to spend $4,500 on a treadmill. It's <laughs> not feasible now. It's $1,500 on a on a bike. Well, so then what, what's the it, monthly subscription as well too? Cause. So I think the monthly subscriptions between like 30 or 40 bucks a month, which yeah. that's, that's their bread and butter. I mean, any subscription service is great and they have a lot of paying subscribers right now that they're just basically printing money with. There's mm -hmm. very little overhead they have involved other than paying their trainers and getting that content, which will just continue to churn through. But um, I don't know. I think I think the valuation was definitely too high for sure, just like a lot of tech companies and a lot of growth companies are finding out right now. But I think over the long term, it's going to find its kind of balance and grow from there. And maybe they'll be bought out by a bigger company like an Amazon or an Apple or uh, um, I forget who else has been discussing potentially acquiring them. But uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting one. I could see it going both ways. I've heard and read stories on both pro and con or bull and bearish. On right. Them. So that's that's an interesting one. I'm going to go. They're going to they're going to survive. They're going to eventually thrive, but it might take more than a year. So I agree. Let's see what's the, what's their stock price at right now. Yeah, retrospect. That was a terrible pick. It was one of the first ones that came to my mind. I think I was reading something on them a few days back. So they're at twenty six dollars and seventy cents right now. Their peak was one sixty two, roughly. Okay. So that's a heavy fall. <laughs> Extremely. Granted, they did they did IPO at twenty five dollars and twenty four cents. So technically, they're up on their IPO. Um, <laughs> but better yeah, than Coinbase. It's, it's it's simmering right now. So we'll see. Um, yeah, it might be a, a good buy. I might buy some Peloton stock to to support I my running habit. I, I probably don't recommend it. I, I guess at this point, because I just said that <laughs> I could see Peloton doing well, I might need to buy some, but I'm going to stick with well, buy, we, uh, buy we ETFs. Should do, maybe, maybe next week we should consider both. We should do some research over the next week mm -hmm. and actually pick a stock that we both think will be a big winner in the next 365 days. Is there a market and cap? I feel like we should we should have a specific market cap that we have to look in. 
Okay, you you pick the market cap, okay. and we'll pick a couple of companies from that market cap, and let's put like a thousand dollars in or something, and see where we are at the end of the next year. Okay, and we'll have to pick a prize. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> maybe okay. the winner. Maybe the winner gets the other. The loser's <laughs> actual stock. <laughs> well, what happens if we both lose? Is it just the battle of the the smallest yeah, loser at that both, point? <laughs> yeah, if both companies go bankrupt or something. Exactly. We'll we'll have to figure that out, but I think that could be a, a fun thing for the listeners to follow through on. Yeah, all right, we can get on. we can get creative, creative. Okay, so okay. Coinbase or not Coinbase, crypto. Coinbase is just in my head now. We got to shift from the markets <laughs> to uh, to crypto. Um, coin shares weekly report. I found it yeah. pretty interesting about, obviously there's been, you know, quite a bit of, of, um, you know, outflows within crypto as the last, I think when did, when did Bitcoin hit its peak? Was it mid December plus or minus? Yeah, I think early December it hit its newest peak. Let's see. Yeah. Cause coin shares reported it had some interesting pieces about I think I think a lot of the institutional buyers are getting a little bit more conservative of choosing kind of Bitcoin for at least for the next you know call it the next few months or so traditionally as well when when January has been a red month February is for, there was seven out of nine of the last years or so um, it might even have been all of the within the last nine years or so whenever there was a red January February was green um, mm -hmm. but uh, it was it, November 10th by the way that November tip is when it hit to speak. 69,000 and Ether hit 48.78. Okay. And then we dropped to 31,000? 31, 31, 3100. Or uh, 31,000, you're right. Okay. For uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. We're probably right around 36 to 38,000 right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the funds, it looks like, are, are kind of focusing on, on Bitcoin, at least institutional. Um, one thing I did see that was kind of interesting on, on that report specifically. It had, it had highlighted uh, the outflows of Ethereum, and those had been fairly large over the last few months. Um, but simultaneously, um, ARK Investments did their, what do they call that? Uh, I know it's the, not the big dream. What do they refer to? Big Ideas 2022. Kathy Woods wet dream? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Kathy Woods was, <laughs> they're, they're very excited about Ethereum is basically what this report said. Um, <laughs> And it had mentioned uh, approximately or up to within the next 10 years, a 75X on Ethereum, um, which is massive. And uh, a lot of that was focused around, you know, the shift, obviously everything going digital and a lot of the kind of the, the digital um, ad spend would be increasing and we're moving out of, uh, we're moving into the technology age and there's going to be a lot more eyes. Everything's going to be focused around um, transactions that are online and, and cryptocurrencies are, are obviously a very um, ideal way to do that. But it was it was interesting to me to see some of the institutional buyers, you know, moving away, at least on this report. And granted, you know, that's a small sample size within the last, you know, six to eight weeks. And there was, you know, a massive correction in the market. So that's understandable. But, you know, simultaneously you have Kathy and her team coming out and, talking about a 75 X and 10 years is a, is a long time. And, you know, I don't think that Ethereum will get to that number. I think I could, in my head, I could see it getting to about a hundred thousand um, yeah. dollars. Yeah. I know um, you've been in Ethereum for a long time, but what is that? What do you think about that? Yeah, it's an interesting thought. And just for the listeners, I'm going to show you, um, this is the coin shares reports that you can look through. This is what Chris was referring to. The first page, um, if you can get the charts to load, if not, I can share my screen as well too. Let's see if I've got it. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of Ether in particular, I actually listened to, have you heard of the Bankless podcast or newsletter? Um, who's, well, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank at the moment. So it's these two guys that created a newsletter and then turned into a podcast. I think they still do both. And they may they may have a DAO too. I don't know. But um, they, they were doing a podcast the other day. Um, 
and they were they were talking about Ethereum and where they see it going because e e Ethereum 2.0 2 is on the horizon. They're planning to essentially switch over to the 2.0 platform, I think in the next six months. They've or, been saying that for years though. They have, but they're, they've been making a lot of progress mm -hmm. and they supposedly in the next six months, they'll be on it. We'll see, we'll find out, we'll revisit. But assuming that goes through and assuming the ecosystem becomes more efficient and more layer two um, protocols come into place, Ethereum, what they view and what a lot of people view is going to be essentially just the background chain for lots of different interactions and the layer two protocols are really going to be what reduces the cost of transactions substantially and up to or down to relative zero. So if that comes to be, then I can certainly see Ethereum continuing to grow and the token reaching 10, 50, maybe 100,000 in the next, let's say, five or seven years. I don't know how, how much it could go up. The tricky part is with the Ethereum Foundation, they ultimately can make shifts and changes. They've made changes to the amount of coins in circulation, and um, they may continue to do so depending on how the ecosystem continues to evolve. So it's really hard to say. I think it's easier to predict Bitcoin just continuing to go up in value over time. It's at its core a deflationary asset. And so naturally, if it continues to drive any sort of demand, the price will go up. It's just a mathematical fact. So I foresee Bitcoin definitely reaching 100,000 probably in the next six to 12 months. And I would predict 500K maybe in the next two to three years for Bitcoin in particular. Ethereum, harder for me to predict, but I think the, they're both going to reach their all time highs, hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed in the next few months. So we'll see how that plays out. No, I, I totally agree. Um, I agree. I definitely agree with Bitcoin. With with Ethereum, what'll you know? They were they were first to market, and there's pros and cons with that. You know, look at AOL, look at Yahoo. Um, but I, I do think that some of the kind of the additional change that will link into Ethereum or already link into Ethereum and and already the you know the four momentum that they have is is definitely helpful. Um, but when you think of you know, Solana, there's, there's Avalanche, there's, you know, a dozen other uh, Cardano, you know, that are, that are trying to come at them to be the quote unquote Ethereum killers. Um, but w one of the big things for me is, is the developers because the developers right now, Ethereum has such an advantage because it, it's been the go-to for the last, you know, however many years. There's already so many dApps built on it. It's already, it has so many proven use cases with the craze of NFTs, you know, in the last 18 months or so, it is, it has been the face to that. You know, you've, Solana is obviously, I think they've done over a billion dollars now at this point um, in NFT transactions. Um, I don't know. And I, that could be off. There was, there was something that had to do with NFTs and Solana with a billion dollar number. Um but there are a handful of other ecosystems that do have NFTs as well. I know Cardano is working that way and it'll be interesting to see and, and what type of feedback we get on, on my con comments about Cardano. Ada Gang is usually really strong or people really dislike it. So um, <laughs> might get some conflicting comments in there. When you, have a, when you have a strange and elusive founder. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Charles. He's uh, yeah. He likes to talk. Um, but uh, I believe in I believe in the vision of what they're doing. But um, they've got some dexes on there now. Uh, Sunday Swap I don't think rolled out as successfully as they they wanted it to. They've got another one coming. It's like DX or something along the lines of that. But kind mm -hmm. of going back to the engineering standpoint of it is um, in my head. You know, first markets is is a huge component, but also having the developers be excited about 
your platform and being able to build useful tools on there. Um, I think that's a very important piece as well, too. So I'm sure that that's a you know a huge factor that goes into how how these teams are building out their platforms. But um, I think you know looking at you know different colleges or technical schools or um, you know some of the Fortune 500 companies or even startups of uh, understanding what their developers want to build on i think that's going to play a little bit more of a of a larger role than what people anticipate um as to who you know comes out as the winner out of out of all this and there's going to be multiple winners i don't think it's just going to be one that wins at all i don't think there's anyone that's going to be the quote unquote ethereum killer that that kills ethereum they're probably all going to do very well as long as they're a quality project but um i think the the development aspect is a little bit overlooked Definitely. I mean, where people are innovating <laughs> in an ecosystem in crypto is typically where it's going to thrive. So I think you're right. Um, what I think is often overlooked and maybe a controversial opinion on just the Web3 atmosphere is it seems like a lot of people view it as a binary, one or the other, Web3 or Web2, and Web3 is the natural progression of web two. I frankly see it as a hybrid. I think web two is going to layer on top of web three. Eventually, there's always going to be centralized players, Coinbase, FTX, any any exchange, pretty much besides some of the decentralized uh, exchanges like Uniswap, they're still centralized. And there's still a lot of benefit to being centralized. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's it's really hard to innovate when you don't have somebody or a few people running the ship with a vision. When you have a DAO that's run by committee, I mean, <laughs> we know how well that goes in, in a country that's run by votes. So uh, I don't see that being the most efficient and best innovation in the world. I think these new technologies and just blockchain in general is essentially just an upgrade to the internet protocols that we have today. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the rails that everything eventually is going to be run on. So with that, our financial systems will definitely change. The structures of banks will be much different. And frankly, according to these bankless guys, I tend to agree that there's going to be less of a use for traditional banking systems. And there's going to be a lot more ways that we can do uh, our own banking based on whatever we want to achieve, whether it's gaining yield on money that we have sitting around or lending to somebody else, getting a loan, whatever it is, uh, decentralized you know, applications that are running on Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, whatever, will wind up Uh, allowing us to accomplish that. So just wanted to throw that out there for all you Web3 maximalists. (laughs) I don't think that's the future we're going to (laughs) get. We'll see. Even if that is the future, it's going to take time. I mean, there's... Look how long it took for the inter- the internet to truly reach its full potential. If we're thinking that now is the transition to to something new, um, but out of curiosity, so obviously being in the the insurance ecosystem, what do you see some of the benefits for for blockchain on your guys' end? What what, what type of progress would you be able to make within the space? You know, any pros, any cons? What excites you about it? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think. That's also the future of insurance. Just inherently, if you house data on the blockchain, it's immutable, it's it's much more efficient. And with insurance, that's really what you're looking for. You're looking for uh, contracts that can be written that you don't have to have attorneys battle it out to determine what the contract means, what it doesn't mean. It's right there on the blockchain. And if you trigger something, it'll just do it automatically. So I see that becoming a a big feature in the insurance world where you buy an insurance policy and if you need to file a claim, there would be a guaranteed way for you to be able to file that claim uh, and your smart contract that you have with said Web3 insurance company, whatever you wanna call it, will uh, be able to verify whatever situation occurred and 
pay out whatever it needs to immediately as a result. So you're going to remove so many middlemen, so many actuaries, so many different parts of the, you know, chain that costs a lot and therefore insurance will become cheaper, more efficient and more accessible to a lot of people. So I think there's going to be a lot of innovation over the next 10 years in the insurance world with the the blockchain technology as a whole and i hopefully i'll be a part of it <laughs> in yeah. some way shape or form i feel like and it's something that's always kind of struck my curiosity is the the client patient confidentiality and mm -hmm. you know navigating that with with the public blockchain and i understand that there's ways of you know, all of your information isn't necessarily just going to be available and made to the public, but um, maybe trying to battle some of that perception or educating people on there, there are ways to, you know, to, to protect your information or your client's information. Um, Cause I could see that being obviously a huge red flag. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. I mean, there will have to be some security, some protection, some, uh, some way to make sure that your information's just not leaked all across the internet. So people will figure that out. I'm not one of them, but I'm <laughs> sure people will figure it out. So I'm not too concerned with that sort of thing. No, perfect. So uh, let's talk about wine. Again, yeah. th we're talking about all the things we like. <laughs> um, wine has to be one, or it happens to be one of those. Um, I have been on a, on a little bit of a rosé kick. Um, try to find the perfect French rosé that's not obnoxiously expensive and that's still really good. So I've, I've got right now, I've got kind of my, my 30 to, to $60 bottles that I've been really excited about between uh, a few white wines, a few rosés, um, both from the, the rosés are both from Ban Bandol, uh, the region, and I'm going to butcher the name and I need to work on my French, but the domain to be Bandol rosé, which is, really well known and then um one that's a little bit of a kind of a surprising one can you are you able to pull up the label online to share let it let me see so this one is tough to get this one runs out very quickly um so if you are in the scottsdale area you got to go talk to todd at atlas wine he gets these in oh the unlimited there we go Right here. This is uh, this happens to be my favorite one. Um, I was able to get three bottles of this, and I was able to get a few bottles last year as well too. But it's uh, I don't see this one coming back anytime soon. Um, but gross noire, noir, noire, noir. Um, noire. I think you're right. Yeah. This one, Costco, 30 bucks. This thing was incredible. I I absolutely fell in love with this thing. Can we just give a shout thing. out to the North Scottsdale location of Costco, who I believe is the most lucrative wine seller in the entire country. I think they sell more bottles of wine out of that location than any retailer in the country. It's, yeah. I, which is I, insane. Uh, you just using Vivino, I think it was the recommended price was like 45 bucks or so. And, um, mm -hmm. I had it with a, with a buddy of mine not too long ago and I saw it at Costco and I'm like, Holy crap, that is it. That's uh that's my, my replacement when, uh, when the other one runs out. Um, but yeah, those are, that's uh, back to the never ending portal, <laughs> um, to infinity and beyond. So those two have me excited, um, budget friendly and really good. So, so speaking of Todd. I I had a uh not Todd. What's what's the other guy's name that Jock. Jock. Jock, yeah. Yes. So Brandon Did he have his went dog? into I, I wasn't with him. Brandon gotcha. went okay. into Total or not Total Wine, Atlas Wine, and he spoke with Jock, who made a, a clutch re recommendation. So let me pull this one up. So it's a grape I've actually never heard of. It's I believe called Fresa. And this Lange Fresa Calle, I'm going to go with that. It's an Italian wine. It's a red uh, varietal. 
and the Fresa grape was super interesting to me and price points pretty spot on to what we were talking about today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a little on the dry side and a little tannic, but it was a really good wine. So great pick, Jock. I liked it. Jock, if you're listening, we appreciate you. What's next? I don't know. You sent me some, you sent me a Hublot link and oh yeah, I absolutely, so, this is going to sound you. super snotty, but I absolutely hate Hublot. When I'm, <laughs> so if I'm going to spend the money on a, a watch, I, I buy a watch because in my head you can wear it. It's an investment. It goes up in value. Traditionally, if you don't bang it up and don't beat it up, totally. Hublots go down in value. <laughs> so this is what we're talking about. Hublot released a, a new line of their Big Bang watches. And I am totally on board with everything you said. I traditionally do not like the brand. I think they target an audience that is not me. And I agree, it's traditionally not a good investment. That being said, I really like the look of this watch. <laughs> I think it's a really good looking watch and I would definitely wear it. I don't think I'd spend the $18,000 to get it. And I don't even know if uh, a brand like this or a watch like this is going to be as hard to find as like a traditional sport watch from Rolex or Patek, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I like the way it looks. I think it's really cool. I I kind of so, like the movement in the back. So I, I don't know. I don't I don't love the fact yeah, that I'm saying I kind of like it, but <laughs> skeletonized. And I believe it's in titanium as well. So they did uh, yellow gold, titanium, and a ceramic. The black okay. is the ceramic, as far as I'm aware. And I think the black is limited to like a hundred pieces or something. So, okay. So the black one. Yeah. I got to share my screen it. real quick. Let me just, let me just show you okay. <laughs> a, an amazing solution. Instead of having that, we're going to go back to the never ending vortex here for a second. All right. <laughs> Boom. hundred dollars. G shock. I've got the gray one. I love that. Do thing. You? I do. I do. So, so type in John Mayer G shock. I would get on board with a third one. That was his first collab, oh, right I believe. Here. Okay. Yeah. I think it looks pretty cool. I I don't traditionally do the black watches. My uh, ghost white skin doesn't really collaborate <laughs> too well with the black watches, so I need a lighter palette. But I kind of I kind of dig the way the John Mayer one looks. There is a. Um... There's a there's a Dutch guy. Um, he is hilarious, very very comical um, in the watch industry. His first name's Nico. I don't know what his last name is, um, and he absolutely just he just bashes Ublo all the time, <laughs> and he is a huge hey, fan I, of Casio. <laughs> So he'll just, he had a few episodes where he was just handing out Casio watches. It was, he was so excited about it. But every time I see or hear about a Ublo now, it, it, it just in my head, I hear Nico just totally going off about it. So I think I'm scared. So in, in other news of releases, uh, our friends over at AP launched a slew of new Royal Oak watches to celebrate their 50th anniversary. So this is, of course, what I would choose above the Hublot. I'm really digging the green dial. This, uh, I don't even know what they call it, but I think the green dial looks incredible as well as the skeletonized. Well, because Paddock did the, did the 5711 Nautilus, they briefly brought out the, the green dial as well too and discontinued that. Mm -hmm. But I feel like a lot of the hype is come from Rolex on the, cause they had the Kermit originally. Um, mm -hmm. then they discontinued it. Then they had the Hulk, um, as well. And too. What's the and, deal with everyone coming out with this black ceramic? Why is this a thing? I don't know, but AP did a black ceramic skeleton, um, not too long or a few years back. And then I think if you, if you keep scrolling, I'm sure you'll find it. They've got a, um, 
They They've got, got it. Two beyonds. Uh, yeah, those are really those are really cool. Yeah. The I yeah, think what I mean, they did on this the fiftieth didn't they? Is it a forty one millimeter now? Because I believe it was it was thirty nine or forty. Oh yeah, right well, if, there. If you wanna in. if you wanna be a rock star and rock the forty three with diamonds all over it. You now have that option. I think I need to do some bicep um, curls if I'm going to try to pull off a 43. <laughs> yeah, that'll never fit my wrist, fortunately or unfortunately, however you look at it. Uh, that's fortunate. Uh, this is a 34 millimeter. Huh. So the jumbo extra 39. Thing. Okay, the yeah. skeleton's 39. Okay. That would be perfect for me. I really like the rose gold. Yeah, I dig that. Um, I could sell my house and buy a watch. How? <laughs> <laughs> one of my so the the company Hodinkee. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with them? Very much so. Um, yep. They they do that show talking watches. Have you seen any of those? YouTube shows. I, I think I've seen during quarantine, I think I watched every single one. Uh, the John Mayer, because John Mayer did Talking Watches too. And that's when he was talking about the, uh, that's when the John Mayer Daytona really became a thing. And it was the yellow gold yeah. with the green face, as well as the, I believe the other one is a white gold uh, with the blue mm -hmm. face. Um, and it just drove yes. the prices of those through the roof. So he did this one, Talking Watches 2, mm -hmm. and in that he said his favorite Patek right now is the uh, Nautilus with the green army band. Yeah. And the um... So I love this one, not just because I love John Mayer, but <laughs> because it looks pretty awesome. Yeah, the Aquanauts are great because they've got it in... They've got it in a few different colors, but those straps. So what's incredible is those, the straps alone are ridiculously expensive. I, I don't want to throw a number yeah. out there, but I think it's, I want to say six to $10,000 just for the straps if they're uncut. Yeah. So are you familiar with a company called Joma Shop? I don't think so, no. So it's this company out of New York that basically purchases luxury goods in bulk and they sell them in on what they call the gray market at a discount. So they have a ton of different watches and um, you can buy them essentially new, but you don't get the, the warranty for obvious reasons because you're not buying from an AP, an approved dealer or an AD. You still get me. boxes and papers though, right? I would have to imagine. You you do get the box, you do get the papers, but no... Um, no warranty card. No warranty, no warranty card. Okay. Uh, Aquanaut. So the reason I brought it up... Come on. Ugh, come on. So I came on here the other day. They have the green aquanaut they're not going anywhere below 150 to 220 online okay. right now so i called them immediately <laughs> i was like uh is this real and the guy i talked to he's like oh no we sold this back in uh, september of last year I'm like so why the fuck is it on the website he's like i don't know i i can try to get you one i'm like yeah, I mean, if you can get me one at 125, I'll give you my credit card number right now. <laughs> he's like, he's going to get you right, one me, for the 175. Yeah, he, he, let me look into it and I'll call you. Never heard from him. But, oh, that thing's beautiful, uh, though. Yeah, I would love this watch. Amongst a uh, Nautilus with the Tiffany dial, you know, <laughs> just oh, yeah. just to be part of part of the cool crowd. You and Jay Z can uh, can wear matching yeah. watches. Did you hear or did you see that? I think it was an Instagram post. The guy from the owner of LVMH, um, he had a one-off uh, Patek Nautil or yeah, Patek Nautilus with. Yeah, it wasn't the Tiffany fifty-nine. It, I don't remember which which model it was. Um, it wasn't the Chrono the? Um, yeah. 
So this is him with his son, who's, I guess, the chairman of Tag Heuer, mm-hmm. which I didn't realize. Um, so this is his one-off. Yeah, it's got the, one uh, off. the perpetual calendar is out, that is. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> exactly. Pretty dope. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine how much money that would go for. Well, was the, what was the, the first, um, I don't know if it was the first one. I believe it might've been the first 5711 in the Tiffany blue was auctioned off and granted it was for a, um, my understanding is that it was for a, um, an auction that went to some sort of charity. Exactly. Um, Mm -hmm. which if if you have, I think six to 6.5. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. I don't get it, <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, if Ethereum goes to a hundred grand, I'll be able to <laughs> afford it. <laughs> If you can we'll get your hands on a fifty-seven eleven, it's probably at this point a better investment than Ethereum. That's that's just how insane the watch world has been the last few years. I know. Let alone the wine world. Um, one, let's take a s- brief step back. Um, what's his name? So this guy I follow on Twitter, just bear with me one second here. Essentially the concept is they, they purchase wine, uh, high end wine, and you can basically buy shares of their purchases as an investment and they store it securely and all that. And he, he typically, um, tweets out different statistics and analytics about the returns of fine wine over the past five, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty staggering. (laughs) It's wine has blown up in terms of it as an investable asset. The problem is it's also a consumable asset. And (laughs) when you buy (laughs) really good bottles of wine, it's really difficult to think of it as an investment that you'd sell later rather than wanting to drink the entire bottle. Right. Do you think that, so in the last, and obviously there's been, you know, expensive wine and watches for, for quite some time now, but if we just take a step back the last three or four years, and I think a lot of this was, by the way, shout out to my guy, Anthony Zhang. He's the founder and we've chatted a couple of times. Um, if we're looking at the valuation of, you know, watches, what happened in the stock market during during COVID, crypto, wine, is this because there's an excess amount of cash and, and people are are looking to to invest? Sure. Is it because of <laughs> is it a hedge against inflation, diversification? Look at the real estate market as well, too. It's the it's the everything bubble. And I know that's <clears> become a, a very common phrase now, but when is if and when does the everything bubble pop? even company valuations. Yeah. I mean, it's in my view, it's like a bubble on a bubble on a bubble. What I mean is we we're in what a lot of people would call like a peacetime mode right now. We're not directly involved really with any wars, although it's bubbling up over in Ukraine and Russia. So we'll see (laughs) what happens there. Um, But over the past 10, 15 years, it's not really been uh, a situation where there's much to worry about. And so the economy has just grown and grown and grown, and there's really no stopping in sight. And with that, I mean, we've seen real estate just continue to thrive. We've seen the economy continue to thrive and then add a pandemic to it where we printed you know, 40% of our, mm-hmm. uh, our, um, what is it? GMV or 40% of our money in circulation. Right. We added on to it and we were, you know, paying people for unemployment more than they were making in their previous jobs, et cetera, et cetera. There's just cash flow everywhere and it has to go somewhere and people mm-hmm. are putting it in uh, meme stocks in crypto and whatever. But I do think I was seeing the watch world, the wine world, 
and some other assets like that, those have been thriving for, I'd say, starting in the last 10 or so years. And that could just be just because the economy was booming. I don't know. But I don't know. I don't see a lot of that totally bursting. I think we might see a a winter of sorts Mm -hmm. where they just kind of settle and maybe they don't continue to increase like they have 30, 40, a hundred percent over each year. Um, we'll see. I, I think over the next year, we're definitely going to see a slowdown in the craziness of investing in game stops of the world <laughs> or, um, you know, those types of rallies. I, I don't know. It'll be interesting. You don't want to get Wall Street bets going against us. So <laughs> no, no offense taken to anybody there. Well, one thing I've found fascinating is the face of Wall Street bets, that roaring kitty guy. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember his full name, but he, he's like MIA. He hasn't posted oh, really? anything on Reddit or YouTube or Twitter or anything since I think June of last year when, you know, GameStop was kind of coming back into play, but not at its peak. So maybe he just sold and is living on an island somewhere. Who the hell knows? I so I I, I think I, I watched an episode of of Graham Graham Stephan's show, and mm-hmm. if I remember correctly, he was on it, and he had he had been he had been talking about how some of the difficulties of trademarking because it was a page on Reddit and it wasn't mm-hmm. individual it wasn't you know obviously it's not a separate website it's it's a it's a thread or you know uh within within reddit um but i know that he was i believe he had a book that it came out he was working through a variety of other projects if you will as well too i think he even mentioned there might be some sort of documentary coming out um hmm. but yeah i will have to do some research and see what actually came out of all of that and if he's what he's up to that'd be interesting to find out we'll see Roaring Kitty 2.0. I'm curious what you're doing. Give us a shout. We'll have you on. (laughs) Perfect. All right. Well, let's wrap it for today. Yeah. It's just a, just a taste of what you're going to (laughs) get. Absolutely. All the excitement is uh, still yet to come. Everybody. Thanks for swinging by. Uh, Hopefully you enjoyed the conversation and uh, if you had a good time, make sure to leave us a comment. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. Make sure you hit that thumbs up and uh, give us a, give us a subscribe. Too many S's. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Cheers, guys.